This scripture in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6, Paul said, the apostle Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, he was another minister, but God gave the increase. Wow. So that neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. So when you, when you hear this word preached today, like I'm doing right now, I'm either planting seed or watering seed. That's what Paul's talking about. If you've never heard it, uh, I'm planting. Or maybe you did hear it, but you didn't really get it. I'm planting seed. But uh, you want to keep hearing because that's how you grow and that's how you flourish. What, what you don't want to do is when, uh, when it's a scripture you're familiar with is uh, shut it off without realizing it by thinking, oh yeah, I know this, I've heard this, you know. Because that's when the real growth and change comes in the watering. If we don't water our yard on a regular basis, it would turn brown and die in almost no time. Uh, you know, even with good seed and good soil and good sun. So you got to keep watering it to be healthy and bright and flourish. And the same thing is true with you spiritually. So it, in the word, there's always a whole lot more. No matter how much you think you know about something, there's always a whole lot more because this is not just a book. This is not a history book only. This is not just literature, although those things are all in it. This is not dead words on a dead page. But listen to this in John chapter 1 and verse 1. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. But look at this, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Notice it says he when it's talking about the word. It's referring to the word. It says he. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. Verse 12 says, but as many as received him, that's us, to them he gave the right or the power to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, that's us. Who, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. We've been born of God. And verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. That's talking about Jesus when Jesus was born. The glory of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and full of truth. Wow. So he, he is the word. That's why you can't exhaust it. Because there's always something that you'll see, a new side that you've never seen before, a new revelation you could get out of a scripture you've been knowing for decades. You can see something you've never seen because he is the word. So in 1 Corinthians, what we just read, notice he said, it's not that big a deal who did the planting or who did the watering because it is neither he or she who plants or he or she who waters, but God who gives the increase. Amen. We're always magnifying him. The Amplified says, but God all the while was making it grow. Even when you were doing your part, even when you're watering, God is the one that's making it grow. God instituted a law in the earth called seed time and harvest. And he said, as long as there's daylight and dark, summer and winter, heat and cold, there's a law that will always be here called seed time and harvest. So we do our part in the planting and the cultivating and the maintenance uh, uh, we do our part and the watering, but make no mistake, God is making your lawn increase. It's God. Everybody say it's God. it's God. He is the God of increase. That's who he is. That's what he does. That's his will. That's his plan always. Amen. And if he is, then he's not the God of decrease. He can't be ever. You know, I mean, if you're the God of increase, you couldn't be the God of decrease. You, you couldn't be the God of staying the same, you know, the God of the status quo, the God of average. He's none of those things. Everybody say, my God, my God. is a God of increase. He's the God who gives the increase. Now, look at Psalm 115. 
and verse 12, uh, it says, The Lord has been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He's been mindful. He's got his mind on you. You know what he's thinking about when he's thinking about you? Blessing. About ble That's what it just said, blessing you. Verse 13, he will bless those who revere and worship him. That's us. That's what we're doing right now. Both small and great. That's everybody. <laughs> That's everybody that believes in him. Now, I like the, uh, verse 14, uh, I, I like the King James Version because it's more accurate to the original Hebrew. It says, the Lord shall, this is without a doubt, the Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. Wow. Say, it is written. Psalm 115, verse 14. The Lord shall increase me. More and more. Me and my children. That's something you should be saying all the time. Because you need to get it in you. It's already true, but you need to get it in you. Because when you get it in you, that's when it becomes real to you. And it's not just words on a page. This is God talking to you. And the more you hear it, and the more you say it, and the more you, you think on it, the more you meditate on it, the more you focus on it, it will become more real to you. I mean, if he would have just said, I'll increase you. I mean, that would have been enough to shout about. That would have been great by itself. But he said, more and more. What does that mean? That means it's progressive. That means it just keeps on going and keeps on going and it doesn't end. Shall increase is a compound word, Yosef, in the Hebrew. This is what it means. This is what it says he wants to do to you. Add, conceive again, exceed further, get more, give more over, make much, proceed further. Now notice in that is no running out, going backwards, decreasing, getting less or taken away. It's just nothing but good. It's nothing but increase. He's the God of increase. He's the God of more and more. So do you think we ought to be running out or running over? It's amazing how plain and direct this is in the Word of God. I mean, how many scriptures do we know just like this? He wants to give to us exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think. Everybody say exceedingly, exceedingly. abundantly, abundantly. Above. above. He wants to give to you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. He said, I came that you might have life, have it to the full in abundance until it overflows. He'll make you rich enough to be generous and to give to every good work. You'll be blessed in the city, blessed in the country, blessed coming in and blessed going out. Everything that your hand touches will prosper. He'll make every favor and earthly blessing come to you in abundance. He shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack. John said, I pray above all things that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. Let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. If you being carnal know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father give good gifts to his children? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, all these natural things shall be added unto you. Not taken away, added to Jesus said, there's no one who's given up anything for my sake or the gospels, any natural thing that they will not receive now here in this life, a hundredfold of the same thing. Jesus very first miracle. We just studied that. I think it was last week was provisional and really it was excess. He turned water into 120 gallons of the best wine. That's the low side. It could be an up to, uh, to 180 gallons. And by it, the Bible said, he manifested his glory. Wow. He turned two fish and five loaves into dinner for over 5,000 people. 
And they weren't 12 baskets short. They had 12 baskets left over. That's overflow. That's running over. You know, he could have told them just to fast one meal. It wasn't the end of the world. They were just out there one afternoon. But that's just the way he is. He told Peter, launch out into the deep for a catch. And his load was so big a fish that it broke his nets and started sinking the boats of his partner. I mean, if it starts breaking nets and sinking boats, that's too much. But God can't change who he is because you got a weak net and a little boat. He's just a God of too much. That's your problem. That's not his problem. Prosperity followed him everywhere he went. And in it, he was demonstrating to the disciples and to us how to walk supernaturally in a natural world. You'll be like a tree planted by living waters that brings forth fruit in its season, and your leaf will not wither, and whatever you do will prosper. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and delivered him out of all his trouble. We went through fire and water, but you brought us out and into a wealthy place, a place of great wealth and abundance. God brought them out with silver and gold and not one sick among them. Blessed are the ones who worship the Lord. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house. God raises the poor out of the dust and lifts the needy out of the ash heap that he may sit with princes. Your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow. Overflow. Does that sound like running out or running over? The generous will be made rich, and he who waters shall be watered himself. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the righteous. A faithful man shall abound with blessing. The trustworthy person will get a rich reward. Be fruitful and multiply. He said, I'm your shield and your exceeding great money supply. I am the Lord who will provide Jehovah Jireh. In blessing, I will bless you. In multiplying, I will multiply you. These are just a few scriptures that came to me off the top of my head when I was studying. And I didn't write any of these. It came right from the word. This is straight from the word of God. This is God talking to you. And interestingly enough... This is the most fought message in the church today. Not really just from the world, from the church. Isn't that interesting? It's by design from the enemy. Because you can't go into all the world and preach the gospel if you're broke. And the enemy wants you broke and powerless. That's right where he wants you. To, he wants you sick, broke, and powerless. But when you read about God's people and how he blessed them, Abraham, Solomon, Job, these, these were God's people. They served God. Multi-billionaires. And God is the one who did it to them. Not one single one of them got it on their own. God did it. And he went into detail and showed us exactly how he did it. And he told us to do the same thing. To walk, we are to walk in the steps, we're told in the word, to walk in the steps of your father in the faith, Abraham. Oh, you got to watch it. No, you got to stay away from that prosperity. Stay away from the Bible? What, who, what do you suggest we follow? Stay away from God's word? I mean, I just read a handful of scriptures that I instantly thought of off the top of my head. There's a couple thousand, I've been studying it for almost 40 years, a couple thousand just like it. Over 2,000 scriptures on prosperity and how God wants to bless you. So this is the word of God. This is not religion. That, mostly what's taught today is religion. See, even, even Christians have been submersed in pop culture and, and uh, you know, that over all, they believe that over all, all the scriptures I just read, they believe what's taught today in pop culture. They believe what they read on TikTok. <laughs> it's the truth. It's so true. What they read on Facebook, they believe that over what the word, if it's in contrast to the word of God, they're like, well, that makes sense. It's astounding. Christians, 
They don't base anything on scripture. They make up their own doctrines, uh, which they don't live by themselves, by the way. You know? Or, and if they do take a scripture, it's twisted or out of context. But this is the truth. His word is truth. Really, whether you believe it or not, it's still true. I don't know about you, but I'm just enjoying being blessed. I'm enjoying being a blessing. You know what? We, we, we gave a, a, a car away a couple weeks ago. I love being able to do that. It was good seed, man. It was precious seed to me. And we sowed it in good ground. And I think that's nine or ten cars that we've given away. I want to be known for that. How cool would it be to be known for being generous? And I want to be known for walking in love and being a blessing to people. Amen? Uh, uh, but you know, if you don't have it, you can't give it. Why is this so hard to get a hold of? If you don't have it, you can't give it. You know, you would have to have supernatural help from the enemy to not see this. It would take a theologian to confuse you <laughs> about the blessing of God and all those scriptures I just read to you. You cannot give what you do not have. The blessing of the Lord, it makes rich... And he adds no sorrow with it. Wow. He's just adding, uh, adding what makes you rich, he said. That's amazing. Uh, remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. Deuteronomy 8.18. It is it is the Lord your God who gives you the power to become rich. Good news translation says. Why? So you can be a blessing. Our goal is to be like him. For God so loved the world that he took. No, he gave. It's his very nature. Amen. And uh, you know this, the enemy is always trying to instill in you, instill in people a fear of running out. It doesn't matter how much retirement you have or how much you can watch the, the commercials. They try to put it into you too. Oh, yeah, I have the 401k, and I have this, and I have that. Well, it's not going to be enough. She tells her husband at the kitchen table. It's not going to be enough. I don't, I, let's just see a show of hands of anyone who's experienced the fear of running out. Maybe we won't have enough at some time about something. That never comes from God. Amen. That's the, the enemy, that's his big M.O., and it, uh, you, you, you've got to get that out of you and get what God says. It, God didn't give you a spirit of running out. He didn't give you a fear of running out. He gave you a spirit. Uh, he didn't give you a spirit of fear, period. He gave us a spirit of a power and love and a sound mind. A revelation of how much he loves us. Or you need a revelation of how great his power is. Because that will cause you to be settled and confident that you will always have enough. And you will always be taken care of. And that will deliver you from the fear of running out. The enemy is always trying to get fear in you of running out. And the Spirit of God is always trying to get faith in you for running over. You choose to think the enemy's thoughts are God's thoughts. You, you either choose to think on running out or running over. So anything from God will never put fear in you ever. If you're thinking about something and it causes fear to come up in you, that is not a God thought. It's never a God thought. He puts faith in you. Now, one thing that we can all relate to and understand, the current nonstop talk of the climate crisis. It's running out based. It's fear based. You know, there's not going to be enough planet for us. You wouldn't have to be a climate expert or a scientist Obviously, John Kerry's not. Leonardo DiCaprio, ne DiCaprio, neither one of them are climate experts. Le Leo's an actor. That's his qualification. <laughs> and John Kerry has just as much qualification, if not less. He's a lawyer and a politician. 
He, he is the first United States special presidential envoy for climate. <laughs> and they don't really believe it either, or they wouldn't be flying their private jet to the climate summit in Glasgow. If they believed that, they would not be doing that. They'd be taking a boat. And at the, at the climate conference in Glasgow, they're trying to figure out a way that they can take away your SUV and your truck and then get back in their private jet. And I'm all for private jets. But let me tell you something. There's no emergency board meeting in heaven today. You know, tr scrambling, trying to figure out what to do. Jesus, quick, Holy Ghost, come over here. Guys, emergency board meeting. I don't know what I was thinking. We did not make enough. <laughs> There's not enough trees. Did you not see John Kerry on CNN? There's not enough trees. <laughs> How many, you know there's four times as many trees on the planet as there was in 1920? And that's after everyone built a log cabin. <laughs> you know how many bananas there are in the jungle? There's too many. The, the monkeys can't even get to them all. They fall on the ground and rot. There's more than enough of everything. You don't have to be concerned about it. You don't have to be concerned about the air or the trees or the water or any of it. Think about, think about this. Think about the arrogance that's involved in even thinking, thinking, having the thought that man can control it. And I heard someone talking recently, I didn't hear this myself, but they said they heard a climatologist who's been in it for decades and they said, we don't understand the atmosphere. Now that I believe, <laughs> after a lifetime of studying it. And yet John Kerry and Leo's got it, they got it all figured out, you know. Imagine a God, think about this, that would make a planet that couldn't sustain its inhabitants. So if you're not a climatologist, which is a word I didn't even know existed before I started studying this, you don't even need to be thinking about it. Get it off your mind. As a child of God, you're supposed to be free from all fears. Go, go take a Sunday afternoon ride in your SUV and forget about John Kerry and Leo because they're definitely not thinking about you in their private jet. Your God is good. And he's got you. And there's enough trees. And there's enough space. And there's enough air. And there's enough water. And there's enough food. God's got you. He's good all the time. And the more you get a revelation of his goodness and his love and his mercy and his provision, you lose the fear of running out. You know, uh, I, I, this just came to me. Uh, we, we do see starvation and poverty in some place, some countries that's just uh, uh, hard, hard to believe. And if you'll trace back the roots, the paganism and the ungodliness that those countries are based on and follow, there's a lot to say about that. How can you not be concerned about the climate? Everybody's concerned about it. Not if you're in faith. Well, through... Through, tur, turn it to this scripture, Psalm 50. Let me tell you something. Through this fear, you know, this, this fear of running out, people are making God small. Listen to this verse in, in, in verse 21 of Psalm 50. These things, God's talking. You have done and I kept silent. <laughs> you thought that I was altogether like you, but I will rebuke you and set them in order before your eyes. Listen to the good news. You have done all this and I said nothing. Don't assume if God doesn't say anything, he's happy. You've done all this and I said nothing. So you thought that I am like you, but now I reprimand you and make the matter plain to you. God is saying, I am not like you. 
And people that don't know God, they always try to recreate him like themselves. They make God small, but he's not small. We're not running out. There, there's more than enough of everything. You know, if you travel just a little bit, I've flown what's equivalent of over 120 times around the world, over 3 million miles. And you can fly hours and see nothing but trees. Ain't nobody living there. We're not running out of space. We're not running, just because everybody wants to pile up in one spot. Think we're running out. Yeah, you are there, dum-dum. Get out. <laughs> they think that's the whole world. If you watch and hear them talk, they think where they're at, that's the whole world. There's some little tiny spot. If they could see how, how dumb they look in a city of 10 million people marching about, we're running out. And you could get on a plane and fly 20 minutes from there and see nothing but trees and waterfalls and no people. 20 minute plane ride, I've done it from New York City. 20 minutes, beautiful water, hills, trees, nobody living there. They just believe what some idiot told them at the university, you know? Oh, we're running, get a sign, we're running out, we're running. No, you're not running out of anything, dumb dumb. Not running out, that shouldn't even be on your mind. You are not God. That's way out of your wheelhouse, trust me. God is a big God. He's the God of creation. He made everything. There's nothing made that was not made by Him. He flung the stars in space. He measured the ocean in the hollow of His hand. He marked the heavens with the span of His hand. He's the God of increase. He is the God of more and more. And you can tell when you start to believe it because the fear starts to leave you. We're not talking about learning to cope with fear. Get rid of the fear and magnify God. Let me tell you something. Whatever you're magnifying is going to become big to you. Whatever you're thinking about, whatever you're talking about, because right here is your magnifying glass. So if you're talking, I can't believe the, the price of gas, I can't believe, I don't know how we're going to do it. Next thing you know, you're not going to figure out how to do it, because you're magnifying the problem instead of magnifying. Why, why not take the same breath and the same energy, and when you see that gas price go, oh, thank God my God supplies all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And when you magnify him, you know, God's already big. I just read uh, what the Bible said, how he flung stars into space. I mean, he's big. But it doesn't do any good for him to be big if he's not big to you. Well, how do, you, how do you get him to look big to you? Just like you get these words to look big to you. You take a magnifying glass. I can see nobody in here is old enough to need this, but other places. <laughs> you might have to magnify those words. You can get a built-in magnifying glass without a line in the middle of your glasses and no one knows that they still think you're 38. How do you get the words to look big? You magnify him. How do you get God to look big? He's already big. How do you get him to look that way? You magnify him. Right here, whatever you're talking about, that's what you're magnifying. He's the God of increase. He wants to do things for you just to bless you. Even he wants to do things for you you don't even need. Peter didn't need that load that he got. He didn't need all that. He just, needed, he just needed to make a living for today. But he got the biggest load he'd ever got. So much fish, he'd never gotten a load like that. It started breaking the nets. He had to call his partnerships. And they came in, and their boat started to sink because the fish they were taking on was too much. I mean, that's too much. That's like, that's like two or three years harvest in one day. He didn't need all that. They, he, he didn't need to feed the, the 5,000 men plus women and children, so probably 15,000 at least. And have 12 baskets left over. 
Well, I mean, why do you need 12 baskets left over? He can't change who he is. Once he starts doing stuff, once, once he told Peter to launch out in the deep for a catch, God can't change his nature of being too much because Peter's got a little net and little boats. That's Peter's problem. He can't stop increase just when it's full because he's not a full God, he's a running over God. We just read scriptures, overflow, more than enough. That's just who he is. That is his nature. He's always more than enough. He wants to bless you even beyond what you can imagine. Yeah, you don't have to turn here, but listen to this scripture in Second uh, Kings 20. In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death. He had Isaiah the prophet come and prophesy. He said, thus saith the Lord, set your house in order for you shall die and not live. How many of you know that's not very encouraging? And that sounds pretty final. The prophet, God sent a prophet, Isaiah, and said, you shall die and you will not live. Well, it sounds like thus saith the Lord. He's spoken. It's over. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I pray how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. He repented. Hezekiah repented. What all was going on? I don't know what all was going on, but he repented. So-and-so's at the altar crying. Wonder what they did. Who cares? And it happened before Isaiah had gotten in the middle of the court. He's not even out of the yard yet. That the word of the Lord came to him again, saying, Return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus saith the Lord, the God of David, your fathers, I heard your prayer. I've seen your tears, your repentance. Surely I will heal you. And on the third day, you shall go up to the house of the Lord. Now, here's the deal. God did not change his mind. Hezekiah changed. Just because God says something is going to happen does not mean it's his will for it to happen. Hezekiah changed, so everything else changed with him. When you change, all kinds of things are going to be changing. When you repent, when you turn, when you start going a different direction, all kinds of things are going to start happening. And then he said, you're coming off this bed and three days... You're going to be in church, sitting in church in three days. And he's dying. And verse 6 says, and in addition to that, say everybody say and. And, and I will add to your days 15 years. I mean, just raised him up would have been good. But I'm going to add 15 years. And will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. He didn't have to do that. He just added it to him. God's just adding all kinds of stuff here he didn't even ask for. And I will defend this city for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. And Hezekiah said, what is the sign that the Lord will heal me that I shall go up to the house of the Lord on the third? This isn't very faith, but he said it nevertheless. This is Old Testament. He, and he said, this is the sign. This is what Isaiah the prophet said. This is the sign to you from the Lord that the Lord will do the thing which you have spoken. Shall the shadow go forward 10 degrees or go back 10, 10 degrees? He's talking about uh, the sundial. That was their version of a watch. He's talking about the sundial. Show, uh, uh, I'm going to show you. I'm going to prove to you. Do you want, the, do you want the, the shadow to go forward 10 degrees or back 10 degrees? And, he, and Hezekiah said, I think this is funny. He said, well, it's easy for, uh, uh, for it to go down 10 degrees, but let it, the shadow go backwards 10 degrees. Like it's easy for God to change it forward 10 degrees all of a sudden. When really it isn't easier. But he, but he said, it's harder to make time go back. So he said, he said, make it go back 10 degrees. And the Bible says, and he brought the shadow 10 degrees back. Wow. I, I, because you repented, because you changed, I'm going to bring you off this deathbed. And 
I'm going to give you 15 years. And in three days, you're going to be sitting in the house of the Lord. And I'm going to defend this city. He just went on and on and on. And what else? What do, what do you want me to do? And he said, I want you to disrupt the order of the planets and make time change. That's what he said. I mean, nobody had ever seen it go back. I mean, even if clouds came over and you couldn't see it move for a little while, but nobody had ever seen it. When the cloud went away, it was back. That had never happened. They've never seen anything like that. And God said, just because you asked, just because my man asked, what have you been asking? What have you been asking for? He wasn't even in a big position to be asking of anything, to tell you the truth. I mean, he just repented just a minute ago. You know, I don't know what it was, but whatever it was, he needed to repent for it, need to change for it. And now he's asking for all the, and God said, I'm, I'm going to raise you up and I'm going to add 15 years to you. And in three days, you're going to be in the church. You're already going to be restored completely in three days. And I'm going to defend the city and I'm going to do this. What else you want? Make time stand still. Make the, everything stop in the whole solar system and go backwards. And God said, okay, because you asked for it. My man asked. What are you asking for? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I pray if there's anyone in here that doesn't know you as their Lord, as their Savior, they wouldn't walk out these doors without making a decision for you. And I ask you for that in the name of Jesus. If you're in here and you've, uh, you've never been saved, you've never been born again, you've never met the Lord, you've never received Jesus. Those are all terms that we get from the Bible, but if you didn't grow up in church, you may not even understand them, but this is what they all boil down to. If you can't lay down to sleep at night and know, without a doubt, if you were to die in your sleep tonight that you'd go to heaven, you can know. This is not a hope so salvation. We know, the Bible says, that we pass from spiritual death to spiritual life. There's no fear of death whatsoever. When, when, when we leave here, the body, uh, when, the, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Instantly, you're with Jesus. We talk about resting, uh, rest in peace. You are never resting in peace. You are a spirit. You just, your tent, the, the house you live in, that isn't you. It's just a house you live in, it's temporary. But you're going to be get given a glorified body that's going to be just like this one, perfected. You're going to look just like you, only perfected. Absolutely perfect. Wow. But if you don't know for sure, the second invitation is this. Maybe you serve God, but you've been kind of going your own way, doing your own thing, and you want to make a new commitment. Uh, just like Hezekiah, he, he repented and he made, he, he already served God, but he repented, he made changes and he got back into fellowship like he should have been. Maybe that's you and you say, you know what, I need to rededicate my life. I need to repent, change some things. Then we'll pray that prayer also here in just a moment. And if you've never been filled, this is the third invitation, filled with the Holy Spirit, it's the most powerful thing that will happen to you in this life. And let me just say that these uh, altars will be open and we have prayer warriors down here that I mean, they know how to pray heaven and earth together. And you can always come down after every service for prayer, just so you know. So uh, if you don't know for sure, if you died tonight, you go to heaven, or you want to uh, just rededicate your life, may, uh, uh, make some changes like Hezekiah did. If you want to do that, I think it'd be good if we all just prayed this prayer together. All of us, just, just reaffirm our faith. Lift one hand up toward heaven. That's where your help comes from. Say this after me and mean it with your heart. Father God, I come to you in Jesus' name. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me with your precious blood and make me whole and I'll follow you all the days of my life in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Well, come on and give him thanks that heaven's your home.